Uh, good morning, everyone. And again, sorry for being late. Um, M25 was a bit of a nightmare. It doesn't matter what car you got. When you're stuck in traffic, you can't go, go quick at all. What I thought I would come and do to, to, uh, today was just to tell you one story, basically. Um, but it's a story that pretty much changed my life. Uh, and I'm hoping once I've told you this story, it, it might have a small effect on your life. And you don't have to be a world champion, uh, an Olympic champion, the best in the world to be successful or to, you know, to do your best. It's all about the attitude that you take. It just so happens that the story I'm going to tell you was and took place at a world championships. But if you look at all the things, all the things that went into this whole story, it's stuff that you guys can do pretty much every day of your lives. So anyway, the story starts a long time ago, back in 1991, you weren't even born. Um, but I was, uh, I was born, obviously, and I was competing for Great Britain at the world championships. Uh, and the world championships were taking place in Tokyo. And I was in two events. I was in the individual 400 meters, where I was expected to make the final and battle it out for the medal. That's what the form book said. He'll make the final and he'll have a good battle for a medal. Don't know what he'll win, but he should battle it out and win a medal. But in the relay, which is the second event I was in, the 4x400 meter relay, in the relay event, me and the rest of the relay squad, we wasn't only expected to make the final, we was expected to win the silver medal. The favourites for the race was the Americans. The Americans have been unbeaten in the men's 4x400 meters relay event at world and Olympic level for 57 years. Never been beaten, they've won every World Championships and they've won every Olympic Games for 57 years. So they were the odds-on favourites to win the gold medal. Great Britain, we had the second fastest time in history, the second fastest time in the world, we was expected to win the silver medal. Now that team consisted, that relay squad for Great Britain consisted of six athletes. Myself, Chris Akabusi, Roger Black, John Regis, Addy Maffey and Mark Richardson. We were the six guys that had the job of trying to come home with a gold medal. But before we can get our hands on that gold medal, we've, we've basically got two hurdles to get through. Hurdle number one is we've got to qualify from the heats into the final. Hurdle number two, assuming we make the final, we've got to win it, obviously. Now, Roger Black, who was one of the members of the team, had a fantastic world championships. In the individual 400 metres event, he won a silver medal. He finished, second, uh, he finished behind American Antonio Pettigrew, but he won a silver medal. And he'd won a heat, a second round, a semi-final, and then that final where he won a silver medal. So we decided, for the heats of the 4x400, the guy needs a rest. He's had four hard races, he's run his socks off, he's won a silver medal, let's give him a couple of days rest. So we decided he doesn't need to run in the heats of the 4x4. Another one of those athletes, John Regis, isn't really a 400 metre runner. His best event is 200 metres, but we know he can run brilliantly over 400 once a year. So we thought we would save that one good run that he has in those big old chunky legs of his, and we'll save it for the final. Oh God, I'll go and do that in a sec. So that left myself, Akabusi, Mark Richardson, and um, uh, Richardson, Maffey, and uh, Akabusi, I can think of it was for a second, left us four to run in the heats for Great Britain. Now there's four heats, and it was the first two teams in each heat to go through to the final the following day. To cut a long story short, we won our heat, no problems. We were the second fastest team in the world, it's only a heat, we were going to qualify easy. So after the race, we went back to the hotel, jumped on a bus, went back to the hotel, and we met up with Roger and John, and the six of us that evening sat down to have our evening meal together. Now as you can imagine, sitting down in a restaurant, the night or the evening after the heats, the evening before the final, the only topic of conversation really is what went on on the track earlier on in the day and what we might think will happen in the final the following day. So we're sitting there eating our dinner, just talking about, of course the Americans qualified, there were no problems with them, they were you know, looking good, the French had been knocked out, yes, the Germans have made it, the Kenyans have made it, just, just chatting amongst ourselves about what's going on. And halfway through our meal, our team coach walked up to the table and he's got his clipboard in his hand, looking all official, and he sort of walks up and he says, sorry to interrupt you guys, but I've got some information for your race tomorrow. And we said, OK, no problems. The first thing he asked us was, are we all OK, the guys that run in the heat? No injuries, no problems, no pains, no niggles? No, nope, we're all good, no problems? Brilliant. He said, right, here's all the information you need for the final tomorrow. And he starts flicking through his paperwork. Oh, here we go, men's 4 by 400 metre final. He went, ah, the final's tomorrow at 8 p.m. OK, tomorrow at 8 p.m., got it. And you've been given lane number three, OK? Lane number number three. And the order's going to be, here we go, Redmond, you'll run the first leg, Akabusi, you'll run the second leg, uh, Big John, you'll read us, you'll run the third leg, and Roger, you'll run the fourth leg. Good luck, guys, make sure you get plenty of sleep. And with that, 
he done one, disappeared. And we pretty much knew that the four guys in the final was going to be me, Chris, John and Roger. Why? We're the four fastest in the country. And it's the final, you put your fastest guys out. We also knew that the order of those four was going to be me on the first leg, followed by Chris, followed by John, followed by Roger. One of the questions that I get asked a lot is how do you know what order to put people in? How do you work out who runs first, second, third or fourth? Well, it's very simple. At world and Olympic level, it's no different from when you run relays at school. Stick your hands up if you ever run a relay at school. Shout out where you normally put your fastest man. Last, exactly. Roger Black is the fastest man in the country. He's going last. Shout out again where you put your second fastest man. First, exactly. I was the second fastest man in the country, so I'm going first. And the other two, you just chuck him in the middle. That is as simple and that is as technical as it gets at world and Olympic level. As long as you've got your fastest man last, your second fastest man first, the other two, doesn't really matter where they go, they just stick them in the middle. It's important to have your fastest man last and your second fastest man first. That tactically is the way to do it. So that's the order, me to Chris, to John, to Roger, no surprises. We decided to go to bed, get an early night. Roger and Chris were sharing one room. Addie Maffey and Mark Richardson were sharing another room. And that left me with the short straw, because I've got to share a room with John Regis. Now if you wonder why is that the short straw, it's because Big John snores. And that might not sound bad to you lot, but he normally snores out of both ends of it. No, I won't go there. I won't even go there. So, unknowns to John and I, we're just in our room, watching TV, chilling out, talking, just relaxing. I'm sort of lying on my bed, he's lying on his bed, we're just sitting there watching TV, enjoying the evening, just staying nice and relaxed. So we're obviously talking about what's you know, going to happen in the final tomorrow. All of a sudden, there's a knock on our door. Who's that? So I go up to the door and I open it, and there's Roger standing there with a real, real worried look on his face. He's like that. And I look behind him, and there's Akabusi like this. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? So I said, everything all right, guys? And Roger went, oh, we need to talk. Come in. And he just walked in, sat down on a chair in the room, and Chris just walked in with a big grin on his face and sat down. So I looked at Roger, and he's like this. I look at Chris, he's like that. I look at Roger, Chris. So I go, what's going on? And Roger turns around and goes, go on, Chris, tell him what you just told me. And Chris sort of starts laughing. He says, ah, oh, I don't know why he's getting all, all het up for. It's nothing, it's nothing big, nothing, nothing major. It's not even worth discussing, really. Well, what is it then? Well, it's nothing major. I just said to Roger, we were talking about the race, and I just said to Roger, he shouldn't run the last leg, I should. I went, what? I went, well, I just think I should run the last leg on this particular occasion. And Roger goes, see what I mean? See what I mean? So I said, well, OK. Why? Where did this come from, Chris? And he says, well, look, Roger and I have been talking about things, the race. I said, yeah, as we all have. And he said, I've been thinking about my own form and, and the shape that I'm in. He says, I won a bronze medal in the individual 400 metre hurdles, broke the British, European and Commonwealth record, smashed my personal best, beat loads of people that I've never beaten before. And he said, I'm in the shape of my life. In the heats of the 4x4, four four, he said, I jogged round and I smashed my personal best. He said, to be honest with you guys, I'm in the shape of my life. This is my one moment. I've never felt as strong. I've never been as fast. If you put me on that last leg, either with a 10 metres lead or down by 10 metres, I'll bring us a gold medal. And we all sort of looked at Chris and he was serious. And Roger said, see what I mean? So I said, yeah, but why are you getting so upset? And Roger said, because I think he's right. I think we should do it. So I said, OK, what's the problem? Where do you think you should run then, Roger? And he goes, well, that's where it gets a bit crazy, and this is what I can't get, get my head around. So I said, what? And Roger said, well, I think I should run the first leg. And John sort of said, hey? And he said, no, seriously, I think I should run the first leg. He goes, it's just doing, doing, it's just doing my head in. I need to, to, to explain it. I haven't said it to Chris yet. I think I should run the first leg. There, I've said it. I think I should run the first leg. It's out there. What do you think, guys? So John turned around and said to Roger, well, wherever you run, you're going to run well. But why should we put you, our fastest man, on the first leg? And Roger says, well, this is what I've been thinking. For 57 years, the Americans have won every single Olympic gold and World Championship gold in the men's 4x400. And we said, yeah, we know that. And he said, and it doesn't matter over those years what four athletes run, the American team always run with the same tactics. They always use exactly the same tactics. And those tactics are, 
as soon as the gun goes, to get out in front, build up a massive lead, stay in front, and win it by a country mile. Win it by a long way. 50 metres, 60 metres, 70 metres. Every athlete will make sure they get a big lead and extend it and extend it and extend it. So he said, yeah, we pretty much know that, Roger. And Roger says, well, this is where it becomes interesting. He said, Roger said, I won a silver medal in the individual 400 metres. And I turned and went, yeah, I know, Roger, you were, you were just in front of me. Thanks for reminding me of that, mate. Yeah, cheers, cheers, mate. He went, no, 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 no. Technically, that makes me the second fastest man in the world. Yeah, I know, Roger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It means you're a bit quicker than me. Yeah, all right, stop rubbing it in. He said, I was beaten by an American, Antonio Pettigrew, to the gold medal. I said, yeah, I know, Roger. I was a bit further behind him than you was. Yeah, I know all this. He said, no, but they're going to put him on the last leg. So I said, yeah. So he says, so if the fastest man in the world is on the last leg, and the second fastest man in the world for Great Britain is on the first leg, he goes, what do you think that means? At the end of the first leg, Great Britain are going to be in the league because there's nobody else in the world that is quicker than me. I sort of sat up and so did John. We thought, you know what? This might work. We'll actually be in the lead after the first leg, something that's never happened with the Americans before. They like to get out in the lead and stay out in front. So I turned around and said, you know what? This sounds like a pretty good idea. I'm up for this. I don't care where I run now. I run second, I'll run third. I'm re this, this could work. I reckon Chris, you should go last. Roger, definitely first. I'll run second or third. Where do you want to run, John? John said, well, I'd rather run, the first, uh, rather run third leg. So I said, done, I'll run second. And we sat there for a couple of minutes and we said, are we going to do this? Yeah, we are. So we decided to go and see the two reserves who were sharing a room. So we got out of our room, went and knocked on their door and explained the whole situation to them. They thought it was a cracking idea, thought it was a fantastic idea. So we then went and saw the team managers, knocked on their door. All six of us went, knocked on the door, opened the door. There's six athletes standing there. It's about midnight, by the way. And uh, they sort of said, well, what's wrong, guys? What's wrong? We need to talk. So we went into their room and said, well, well what, what can we do for you? Um, uh, we, we know it's quite late, but uh, we want to change the order of the relay. What? Why? Somebody injured? No, 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 nothing to do with injury. We've just been thinking about it, we've just been talking, and we think our best chance of winning a gold medal is to change our order. OK, what do you want to do? Well, we want to stick Roger on the first leg. Hold on, hold on, hold on a minute. Do what? We want to put Roger on the first leg. You want to put your fastest man on the first leg? Yes, anyway, we want to put Roger on the first leg. Uh, I'm going to run the second. Chris, uh, John's going to run the third, and then we're going to have Chris on. Hold on, you're going to have Akabusi on the fourth leg? No disrespect, uh, Chris, but he's not the quickest man in the team. Yeah, we know that. Why do you want to do this? So we spent the next 10, 15 minutes explaining what we wanted to do. After we explained it, the two team managers that were sharing the room just sort of looked at each other and there was like silence for a few minutes. The first question they asked us after we explained why we wanted to do this, the first question that came back from one of the team managers was, are you guys drunk? We said, no. You really want to go, Roger, to you, Derek, to you, John, to you, Chris? Yes. OK. If that's what you want to do, we'll change the paperwork in the morning. Are you sure about this? Because once it's changed, we can't change it. No, this is what we want to do. All right, go and get some sleep. Good luck. And we disappeared. Went back to bed, went to our rooms and went to bed. We woke up the next day and it's the big day of the final. Um, right, there's two things I will tell you about when you compete either at Olympic Games or World Championships. Number one, there's always two athletics tracks. It'll be the same in London next year, there's always two athletics tracks. There's the main athletics track where all the action happens in the, in the, in the Olympic Stadium, and right next to it is another track which is called the warm-up track. And that's where you go down and you do all your warming up and all your preparations before you race, and then you go, you get transported to the main stadium. The second thing, again if you compete at uh, uh, World Championships or Olympic Games, you obviously have to warm up and get you, prepare yourself for the race. You have to be warmed up and ready to race an hour before your race is due to start. So our race is at 8 o'clock. By 7 o'clock, we've got to be finished our warm up and ready to race, even though our race isn't until 8 o'clock. So all of us went down to the warm up track. We did our warm up. I'm not going to bore you with all the warming up, but by about 5 to 7, I don't know, 10 to 7, 5 to 7, we're all warmed up. We're just sitting there or standing around, drinking some water, staying nice and cool, just doing a little bit of limbering, making sure everything's nice and loose. Our coach came up to us and said, all right, are you all OK? Yeah, everything all right? We said, yes, we're good to go. And then bang on 7 o'clock, you hear this announcement. And this announcement is asking all the teams in the men's 4 by 400 metres relay event, please make your way to tent A. And in the middle of the warm-up track are two tents, tent A and tent B. 
It's now seven o'clock, one hour before the biggest race of your life. Physically, if you're not in shape at seven o'clock, you ain't gonna be in shape by eight o'clock. There's no extra training that you can do. You can't go for a run to make yourself stronger, get a bit more stamina. You can't go to the gym to lift a load more weight. That's it. Whatever shape you're in at seven o'clock, that's the shape you're gonna be in at eight o'clock. So physically, there's nothing you can do to change your shape. But mentally, if you're not quite in shape mentally at eight o'clock, at seven o'clock, sorry, you've still got an hour to get yourself in shape by eight o'clock. What do I mean by mentally? What I mean by that is if you're not quite focused, if you're not quite concentrating, if you're maybe lacking a little bit of confidence, you've got an hour to psych yourself up, to get yourself focused, to get that confidence before you compete at eight o'clock, and it can be done. But the flip side to that is, if at seven o'clock you are focused and you are confident and you've got all the confidence you need and your, your, your mind's in gear, you're in the zone and all that sort of stuff at seven o'clock, you can kind of lose it by eight o'clock. So what I'm saying to you is an hour to go before any final, it's not a physical thing, it's 100% a mental thing. So having been in that situation before, the British team, after this announcement asked us to go to 10A, was uh, just been announced, we decided we're not going to go to that tent at 7 o'clock. We're going to start playing our mind games with all the other athletes, all the other teams, and we're going to turn up at about 10 past 7. We're going to make them think we're not running. Let them start thinking about us. Let them wait for us. So we just stood around for 10 minutes, sort of shaking our legs, drinking water, keeping nice and loose and all this sort of stuff, and just going, come on guys, this is ours, this is ours this time. And about seven, eight minutes past uh, eight, uh, seven, our coach said, right, come on guys, it's nearly 10 past, off you go. So we shook all the coaches and the reserves' hands, we said, right, good luck guys. And the four of us started to walk to the middle of the track. Now at this point, the old butterflies start to get going, and the old heartbeats going, you tend to sweat a bit more, your palms get sweaty, because you're nervous, but you don't want to show the opposition that you're nervous. So as we're walking towards this tent, your game face goes on. You start, you take away the, the smiles, and stuff. you're now looking serious, and you put your game face on. And by the time we got to the tent, there was an official on the outside, all four of us had got our, our, our game faces on. The official asked which team here, we said Great Britain, he goes, right, come on, you guys are late. Ticks, up, ticks us off and we walk into the tent. The tent is possibly half the size of this stage area. No, not even half the size. Maybe from the edge there to here. It's just a small tent. And in there are a load of chairs and a table like this. As we walked into this little tent, we were the last team to, to report for the race. So all eyes turned around as we walked in and we just walked in to the tent. All the athletes are now staring at us. Now I said, you're trying to psych the athletes out. And this is exactly what happens. You've got your game face on. You walk into that tent, all the athletes will look at you. So what you do is you pick on one athlete and you stare at them. You stare at them like you hate them. So I've got, I had some headphones on, I listened to the music and I've got my bag and I've walked in and I'm just saying, I've got a bit of chewing gum in my mouth and we've walked in the tent and I've had my eyes closed and then all of a sudden one athlete uh, is looking at me, so I just do this. And we get told to sit down. You don't do this and walk up to your chair and sit down. No, 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 no. You're trying to get into their heads, so you do this. <laughs> And then you just sit down and you are literally staring at one athlete. You are mentally picking a fight with him, but what you're trying to do is get into his head. And I'm saying to myself, yeah, I'm going to kick your butt. What are you going to do about it? Nothing. Ain't nothing you can do about it. He's possibly going, oh my God, he's going to kick my butt. He's going to kick my butt. Doesn't matter. You don't smile at him. You don't wink at him. You don't acknowledge him. You don't twitch. You don't move. Even if you start to sweat, you make your sweat drip upwards. You don't want him to know that you're nervous. If he moves, twitches, smiles, even ten, tends to look away, you've got him. You move on to the next one. And you just sit there staring at everybody. And everybody is in this tent just staring at each other. No one's talking. No one's asking, oh, how's that injury? How's the wife and kids? Oh, you ran well the other day. You're just staring at them because you want to kick their butt. And it's either you kick their butts or they're going to kick yours. And I don't like butt kickings. I want to give the butt kickings, not receive them. So everyone is just staring at everybody. It is deadly quiet. There's only two sounds you can hear in that tent. There's only two things you can hear. Some people are wearing headphones, so you can hear tsk, 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 coming from their ears. The other sound you can hear is because there are a few nervous people in that tent, believe you me. <laughs> <laughs> and it don't smell too good either, I tell you, it does smell too good. So this goes on for, I don't know, what seems an age, it's only about five minutes. And then what interrupts it 
is a couple of officials come in. And the reason you have to be warmed up for the best part of an hour before is because you have to go through a whole series of checks. So what they do is they ask the team who's running in lane number one to come up to the table. You stand on this side of the table with your kit bag on the table. There's a couple of officials there. And they go through a series of checks. The first thing they do is they ask you to take your tracksuit and your t-shirt off to display your vest or the top half of your skin suit, of your running suit. And they then make sure you've got the correct suit on. They give you your numbers, which you pin on. And in a relay, it's different from a normal event because rather than having a number on the front and a number on the back, you have your country's initials on the front. So Great Britain, GBR, America, USA, Germany, GER, Jamaica, JAM, so on and so on. So they give you your, 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 your they call them numbers, bibs if you like, and you get a pin. You pin one on each corner. They then give you a separate number that goes on the back. You pin that on the back. You then get a lane number. We was in lane five or whatever we were in. Um, no, lane three, sorry. So I think it was lane three. Um, we have lane, we have little number threes which you stick on the side of your shorts for the photo finish just in case it's a close race. They then check your bags just for security reasons. They also check your running spikes to make sure they're the, the, correct, the correct length and they're not classed as illegal spikes being too long and all that sort of stuff. So by the time they've done that for one team and get through all eight teams, it takes a little while, best part of half an hour. Half an hour passes, it's now about quarter to eight. We're still stuck in a warm-up tent that stinks and the race is in 15 minutes. So we come out of the tent, we put on a little, uh, on a coach, and it drives us less than half a mile to the main stadium. We get off the bus, and uh, we're met by two more um, uh, officials. And they escort us into the stadium through a load of doors and tunnels, and we end up at this massive tunnel that takes you onto the track, onto the, near the start finish line. And just before we get onto the track, we get told to sit down and put our spikes on. So we all sit down, there's a load of benches, we sit down, trainers off, spikes on. We put our spikes on, then we all go onto the track and do a couple of little runs just to make sure we haven't tightened up or anything like that. Then the track referee comes in and he tells, uh, or shouts out, first leg runners, go and put your starting blocks down. Everyone in the world is expecting me to walk out. Roger picks his tape measure up, walks out onto the track and sets up his starting blocks. Comes back in. Few people have noticed it, doesn't really matter, nothing they can do about it. He comes back in, puts his tape measure in, I'm just sort of in the tunnel, running up and down, just keeping nice and loose, just trying to get my head in gear, just thinking those last couple of minutes. Then all of a sudden, one of the track referee comes in and blows, gives a massive blast on a whistle. And that basically means there's one minute to go. So with that minute to go, people start to get a bit nervous, take a bit more water on. Some people start to take their tracksuits off just to tighten their spikes, just making sure that the laces are all tucked in and all done up properly, checking everything, making sure your numbers are stuck on. Then another whistle goes with 30 seconds to go. At this point, the four of us got together. We all sort of had a huddle. I goes, come on, guys, this is ours. Let's go and kick some Yankee butt. So, no Americans in here, there, by the way. Um, um, so he goes, come on, let's go and do it. So Roger says, yeah, come on, guys, this is ours, this is ours. And he's all pumped up and psyched up. So he takes his tracksuit off, slams it on his bag, and he walks out into the track and stands behind the blocks in his lane. And he's there, like that, just really, really getting really psyched up, and he's ready to go. And I'm pretty much the same, so I take my tracksuit off, and I go and walk into the infield of the track because I'm going to run the second leg. So we're all doing...